Well, good evening, everybody. Reminder, if you haven't done so already, please mute your phones. And uh, there's a pile of assorted books and magazines mainly over there, which you're welcome to have a look at and take. We're doing our things at home. And uh, it's good to have Phil having time to chat amongst ourselves and our colleagues in the state and a long way in our own state, unfortunately. So. <coughs> welcome to tonight's meeting for HSA. For those who don't know me, you probably will do. I'm Warwick Henry, the President of the Queensland Branch for HSA. And I welcome all our members here in the lovely old terminal building for Archfield Aerodrome and Archfield Airport Corporation, very generously allow us to use this for free. Uh, just a couple of mention of news type things. The Tamora Aviation Museum have had their announce that uh, their biennial by Woolbirds Down Under Air Show, it was to be held on the 15th and 16th of this month, has been cancelled. The decision to cancel the event has not been taken lightly, said the CEO, Mr. Keir. However, the unprecedented weather cycles have waterlogged the entire event site, including car parking, aircraft parking, caravan parking, and the tent city camping sites. That's prevented them from being utilised as intended. And one month from now, there'll be the big air tattoo at Raf Amberley. And that's just a month away. Let's hope that uh, those days are okay and the weather's kind for those who managed to get tickets before they sold out, which was very, very quick. Sold out on the Saturday, the first day they were on, and all Sunday tickets have gone by the following day. Um, next month, November, our speaker will be John Minns with a short history on air navigation. About the air tattoo? About the air tattoo. Even though the, uh, the, all the tickets are sold, uh, there are going to be uh, three uh, viewing areas around Ipswich um, to, to view. You have to watch the website. They haven't said precisely where, but it's Springfield Lakes, somewhere over Ipswich and Rosewood area. Oh, well, thanks for that extra information. Barry. So the, the idea is that uh, aircraft will do their thing, their display over Ambly twice a day. There's a, a morning session, an afternoon session. And then uh, they will do something else at each one of those locations before they come back and, and land in that episode. So it's not just over Ambly. And where are they going to park all the cars that people have bought tickets? <laughs> oh, the, the fences are going up now and they're actually laying road, they're laying tarmac right. in anticipation of it being wet. <laughs> so there's some new roads going down. Well, that, I hope will be a handy thing in the long term. Yeah, I, we hope it won't rain. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, but those other venues are going to be catered. You know, there'll be pie carts and other things there, but it, it'll just be a viewing station for a, a, an abbreviated fly past or air show at those locations. Don't know exactly what. When you get the uh, information first, you might be able to email it to on our... I'll put it on our... Yeah, when, when, when they publish it. We won't know any, any earlier than when it's on the website, so... Okay. Thank you, Daryl. Daryl's involved with the Aviation History Centre at, at, at Amberley. <clears throat> I'll just hand the microphone over to our guest speaker for tonight, Ray Villeman. So we're talking about early DC3 operations in Papua New Guinea. All right. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, before I start, I'd just like to have two regrets in my aviation career. Uh, one is that I was never a diary keeper, and I wish I had been, because I just had lost so many names and places. And so tonight I'm working on a very uh, aging memory. And uh, the second thing is that during my time in New Guinea, I was a very keen photographer, and I had a very good set of colour photographs of aircraft and places in New Guinea uh, from that period. But 40 years ago this, this year, my house in Melbourne burned down and I lost a lot. So I've uh, really got very, very few photographs. Fortunately, um, both Warwick and Peter have uh, helped by providing a couple of photographs that we can use. I've decided to leave in a couple which are very, very poor quality, but I thought they were worth leaving in for the sake of being able to make a point. Um, okay, Neil, can we have the first slide, please? please? <laughs> I think most people in uh, would uh, think about New Guinea, if you ask them, where is New Guinea, what's it like? They'd say it's an island up north of Australia. 
it's a very, very big island. Um, the the uh, Australian part of New Guinea here starts on the 141st East Meridian. And uh, we, we, we took over that part of New Guinea uh, in uh, December, September 1914 from the Germans. And uh, the Germans had very little, pretty little interest in it except the German missionaries. And uh, uh, what happened was uh, when it, it, the Australian and New Zealand forces were prepared to take it over by force if necessary, but it, it wasn't, it was just a walk in. The uh, area of activity for, uh, for uh, me in New Guinea with TAA was all around here. I'll, I'll go to the next slide, please, Peter. And uh, I thought this one here would be a little bit better to show you because it tells you a little bit about the topography of New Guinea. New Guinea is mainly very, very mountainous. And the two areas of really great interest are two huge valleys. One is in this area here, known as the, the uh, Wagi Valley. And another one is in uh, this side over here in Western New Guinea, known as the Baleem Valley. I would strongly recommend to you as a historical society that at some stage you give some thought to finding out more about the Baleem Valley. It has a terrific history involved with it, and it does involve some Australian aviation history. The uh, the area to the south of the, Bar the Wagi Valley is known as the Southern Highlands. You've got the Western Highlands here. Uh, the, um, I think we'll leave it at that. And uh, I'll uh, just mention, there's Lay. That was the main TAA base there. The other bases were in Port Moresby and at Medang. Medang was very popular because that Madang was the direct access to the highlands here. Most of the flying activity was into the highlands because these valleys that I've mentioned were absolutely spectacular. They were 60, 70 kilometers long. They had valley floors of about 5,000 feet, a lush, beautiful flat country. And uh, it must have been an amazing sight because in the early 30s, most of the activity was gold activity down around here, around Wow and Malolo. One of the gold prospects was Mick Lay, decided to go up in Hinterland and have a look. And he went up to Garoka and then he went further west and he climbed up these range of mountains and then suddenly found himself looking down at this valley that nobody knew was there. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, that opened up, it was of course, there were no roads into it that day. And there were no roads in for a long time. There are now, but they're still pretty. So that's New Guinea. Um, I'll uh, talk about the DC-3 next because uh, I joined TAA in uh, 1961 and the, the course I was on 13 people uh, and about six or seven of us were ex-TAA and we were told we would go on to the DC-3 and go to New Guinea. There were some ex-service pilots there that were much more experienced than us, and they were allocated to the Viscount. We were a bit jealous of that, but as time went on, we realised we got the best deal. Because everybody I know who went to the beginning says it was the best three years of their flying life. So then we went to do our conversion on the DC-3. And uh, one of the... Uh, one of the things that you hear pilots say often is uh, when they fly a new aircraft type, you say, how was it? And they say, oh, just a big tiger moth. And I think people say that because it's less egotistical than saying, oh, I found it easy to fly. But I think the DC-3 is an airplane that you could say was just a big tiger moth. It was a, a, a tail wheel aircraft in the modern language, a tail dragger. Um, and it was a very... Um, Light, a light aircraft. Now, by light, I mean, why do you call a 10 ton aeroplane light? And uh, that's because I'm talking about weight in terms of wing loading, the weight of the aeroplane relative to the wing. And to give you a bit of a comparison, the DC-3 the DC from 1935 and the DC-9 from 1962 both had about 1,000 square feet of wing. The DC-3's wing loading was 26 and a half pounds per square foot. 
Division on is 120. So on that basis, it says that the BCC was a very light, <coughs> light aeroplane. Um, because it was light and because it was a tail dragger, and it, we were we all had tail dragger backgrounds. We we knew no different. We trained on tail draggers. We instructed on them, and so we found it pretty uh, uh, pretty straightforward. But when we eventually got into the aeroplane, one of the first shocks was when you had to look at the right hand seat. You said, well, "Hang on, look." I'm going to sit there. Where's the instrument? The all engine instrument. Here's, here's all the good stuff over here. And uh, so that was a bit of a shock. The other thing was that you realised when you looked out the front, you couldn't see any nose. And of course, um, but we we actually found that once we got used to it, we could fly the aeroplane quite well. Looking over the other side, we also found that in the centre there was another artificial horizon and direction of gyro there. And they were for controlling the autopilot, but we could use those. Yeah. An interesting story there is that there's a, in one of Ernest Scan's mm. books, he talks about in northern Canada where it was very, very cold, that one of the old captains who tried to keep his hands warm just to have a long stick with a rubber, rubber end on it so he could work, sit down in his seat and work controls on the uh, autopilot controls from the, from the stick. <laughs> But now, when as a GA pilot, we joined the airline, we didn't have instrument ratings, we didn't have multi engine experience, most of us. And in those days, the airlines assumed when they got a pilot from GA, they were going to have the training for that. And they did, and at no cost. That's changed these days. And uh, so, my, my time at, uh, on the conversion was about 10 or 12 hours, during which time we actually did learn to fly the aeroplane from the right hand seat quite well using the instruments on the left. And it was at times it was pretty, pretty hard because the radio aid flying using the radio compass uh, had to use a manual loop. So you had to be winding the manual loop left and right. So you were flying the aeroplane from the right hand side, looking at the left, operating the manual loop, and doing mental arithmetic at the same time for your, your approaches. But we, we got there. The uh, TAA uh, were very good in that they didn't do, they didn't distinguish between a captain and first officer when it came to type training. You did the same training for both, even though DCA in those days would insist on only giving the first officers a second class endorsement. As far as TAA was concerned, everybody was the same. And the advantage of that was that later on, when the captains would give a first officer a sector, they didn't have to wait, say to themselves, oh, a bit of a crosswind blowing, maybe I better not give him that one, because they'd know that he was competent to do it. He'd been trained to the same standard. <clears throat> now, uh, landings, let's talk about landings a bit. Now, I know I'm talking to people who probably know just as much about them as I do. There are basically two types of landings. You know, there's a three-point landing and a wheeler landing. Now, if we work on the fact that both of them do the same sort of approach. So you come down to a height where you have to check your descent for a round out, the round out. And after you've rounded out, you're then flying level over the ground and the airplane is starting to slow up and it wants to sink under the ground. So to prevent that, we start to raise the nose or, and that puts the wings at a greater angle to the airflow. So the wings are supplementing the lift that we're losing as the speed reduces. Eventually, there comes a point where they, the, the wings can't produce enough lift anymore, and the airplane flops onto the ground. And preferably, you'll have all three wheels in exactly the right place, and you just sink gently onto the ground. The other form of landing is a wheeler. In the wheeler, we come down, we round out just the same, but we don't hold off. We just let the airplane sink onto the ground level. And in uh, it was a very important in New Guinea because we had to use the wheeler technique a lot. TAA took the view, even though most DC-3 operators at that stage were saying, no more three-pointers, everybody does wheelers. But TAA said, if you want to do a wheeler, it's up to you. The conditions are right. If you want to do a three-pointer, conditions are right, do it. But on the short trips, the advantage of the wheeler was we could park the airplane on the ground very quickly and now, most 
tail drag us. If you've got it on the ground in that attitude, the last thing you'd want to do is touch the brake because you've got the possibility of going on. The DC3 was particularly good like that because it had very strong elevators. And you could actually, once you had it on the wheels, you could actually be quite hard on the brakes. So on the short strips in New Guinea, it was very important that we were able to do the wheel, get it on the ground, get the brakes on. If you did a, a three-pointer, of course, you use up a lot of runway doing it. And if you mess up a three-pointer, and it is easy to do, and especially in an aeroplane, then as I said, it's quite light. If you mess up a three-pointer, you can easily get a bounce going or something like that. And in correcting that, you use up a lot of runway. So we were well versed in those two landing techniques before we went to New Guinea. So after conversion training down here, I was sent out to the Channel Country in Western Queensland to do a little bit of consolidation. And then it was off to New Guinea. Now, the, for a 20 year old going to New Guinea, I won't say it was scary, but it was daunting. And uh, the whole thing had an air of mystery about it because the, the DC 6 that we went up in left Sydney about eight at night, went to Brisbane, turned around here, left Brisbane about midnight, arrived in Port Moresby at six o'clock in the morning, and then stayed there for an hour, then took the hour to go home to lay. And so young bloke arriving in Port Moresby at six o'clock in the morning, to get out in this hot, this humid atmosphere, which you're not used to, and there's all sorts of people running around on the tarmac because there were no, there were no terminal facilities. People running around, a lot of them were black and wearing lap laps. And when you look past the DC 6, you can see these foreboding looking mountains at the back, which is the Owen Stanley. So it, it, it all was a bit foreboding. After the, they turned around in Port Moresby, the crew invited me to sit in the cockpit for the flight up to Lay, and they showed me a mountain on the lap called Mount Yule. And the significance of Mount Yule was it had a white cross on top of it, which was made from the components of an aircraft that crashed there during the war. And then um, we arrived in Lay, and Lay was our, our um, main base. TA had taken over the operations in New Guinea in the middle of the year before, middle of 1960. There were still pretty early days in that process. Some of the aircraft actually still had uh, hybrid color schemes on them, some bit of quad, a bit of TAA. The TAA facility there, which was taken over from Qantas, was a, a central dining room, come bar, come tennis court, surrounded by a group of dongers, each with six or seven rooms, and we were just allocated a room each. It's pretty comfortable. And uh, once we were settled in, it was then time to start uh, looking at how, what sort of flying we're going to do. Can I have the next slide? Uh, oh, that was just a close up to see here. All the instruments on the copilot side there for engine instruments. Here's all the flying instruments there and there. One of the other things about the cockpit, of course, which is a bit uh, unusual, when you look at the attitude of the DC-3, as you, and you don't have the nose in front of you, as you started the takeoff roll, you actually descended onto the runway. Okay, I'll jump ahead a bit here. What, what we're going to do is, uh, one of the first things we had to do was try to learn pidgin. Now, pidgin is the official language of New Guinea, but and uh, it's developed amazingly. It's a very phonetic language. You can see how they spell New Guinea. And I, I called it a, a Lego language because it's sort of built up of little blocks. It's got a very limited vocabulary and you, it becomes descriptive using the words you do know. And I've used an example there. The aeroplane is known as a Balu. So the captain was a master on Balu. And little, the word for little was liquid. So the co-pilot was a liquid master on Balu. And uh, uh, ocean was called soda water. So a seaplane was balanced along soda water. Now, here comes a tricky one, an amphibian. I've got a wrong word there. That belongs shouldn't be in there. The aerodrome is just known as place balus. So an amphibian was balus. He got savvy up long, longer soda water and place balus. So it was a cumbersome sort of language. Um, I'll put another little build up there. Food was called kai kai. Baby, pick a ninny. Insects, binatang, there were plenty of them. 
Now here's another build up. Milk was susu. And breasts were susu belong Mary, because Mary is what they call the uh, women. Okay? And a fish is a bonus. So a brazier became a bonus belong susu. Okay, I think we. And now, the other thing I just thought I'd like to mention here one of the nice things about having been in New Guinea is that there were some expressions that were particularly expressive and appropriate. And amongst old friends who were there, and a friend incidentally was called a one talk. So, amongst our one talks, when we meet, we still tend to use that for some of these phrases. And they, they really are a very good. If, that's for instance, if you meet and you have a whole lot of arrangements, they all go wrong. And you just say, oh, uh, uh, all your bugger up. And, um, or if you're going to say to somebody, don't worry about something, don't be nothing. And amongst the New Guineans, I find even you know, nearly 60 years later, we still use those expressions amongst ourselves. And they were some of them. Uh, you'd say, a question, what name something? Friend was a one talk. Someone's crazy, he's long on. And when you leave somewhere and you're not coming back, you sort of go and finish. At one stage in the airlines before PA, they used to have flight logs. And the flight log was a thing that the crew would write out and hand back to the passengers. And it would have um, you know, the airline's uh, emblem on it. And it would have aircraft position, uh, altitude, speed, name of the captain, what the weather was like. And for a little while, we had the same things in New Guinea, and I've never been able to find one. I'd love to find one because it was all subtitled in pigeon. So Balas became, position became Balas, he stopped on top. And ETA became time he come up. And the hostess was Mrs. Vaughan Balas. And when you tell someone to put your seatbelt on, fast him ask long, fast, fast him ask long, you're longer Balas. And uh, now, Australians, you know, we have a great propensity for giving people names, nicknames. The, wood in, the, name in, for the, the name for a box is, or New Guinea, sorry, the pigeon for box is box, and wood was D-Y. And of course, one of our friends up there was a fellow by the name of Chester Wood. So what was he called? Box D-Y. Now, I'll just finish with a little story about pigeon here. Each year they have very, very good shows at Taropa and Mount Harga, really spectacular shows, big fellow season. And at one of these at Mount Harga, the natives had built a, a pen and they had a crocodile with it. And uh, Chip Shrafferty, who's a big guy, you know, he's standing, a big tall man, standing up very high, decided to ingratiate himself with the natives. And he came up and he said, Oh! Big fella, big fella, back pack. Well, that really broke the natives up. They were just falling about laughing. And Chips couldn't understand why he was so funny. Until someone explained to him that, that the crocodile is a puk puk and the peck peck is a human species. <laughs> okay, this is the, the, the root structure for TA in New Guinea. Um, the, as I said before, the main base there, there were so many airports up in the Spargy Valley, it was easier to operate you know, out of the bank for them. And then the rest of the flights basically coastal were operated from Lay. When a, when a pilot got up there, a captain, he had to be endorsed, route endorsed on aerodromes and, and, and on uh, routes into and from the airports. The first officers didn't. So we had the advantage that we sort of flew everywhere. And the, the, uh, the captains started off when they came up, they were usually sent to do coastal flying first. The coastal flying was pretty easy. The, the weather wasn't bad and the navigation was pretty easy around there. And they didn't have to fly through the mountains. But once the, once the pilots started flying in the highlands, they were flying through the mountains. So they had to learn all the navigation with visual and map reading. And they had to learn their way through the mountains because the DC-3 couldn't fly over them, it just didn't have the performance to do it. And uh, so they would, the uh, Department of Civil Aviation had requirements for different airports and, and different routes. And one example would be uh, Lay's just there, just stop me with a shaky hand, it's just so far away. Just here you've got Lau and Malolo. 
It's only about 40 nautical miles away. It was a very high country in between. There were three major rivers that went into there. The Wadden, the Wobbit, and the Snake. And, they, and the Civil Aviation Department would require that a captain would fly through each one of those passes before he could land the well or the lolo. So the, the, it took a while for the, the captains to become fully endorsed. And after they got a number of these endorsements, they were then given uh, under the Civil Aviation and Navigation Orders and ANO 28 qualification, which meant they could fly anywhere. But the advantage we had as first officers was that we didn't have to have the endorsements, so we just flew over. The, uh, the flying was, the, the weather, let's talk about the weather. The weather in New Guinea was that uh, there were very, very little wind, not much wind at all, as a result, not much turbulence. The main weather we had to worry about was cloud and thunderstorms coming up in the afternoon and filling up the gap. So, and usually, just about every afternoon, you could expect a huge buildup of cloud and heavy rain, which is, was very nice when you're living there because it cooled the place down. One of the things that the pilots had to, the captains had to do, um, it was learn to fly mountain flying. And because we were flying through valleys to get into places, um, mountain flying was quite different. And one of the things you'd, some of the things you would learn is one is that when you were flying up the valley to get into a place, before you flew into a valley, you had, you had to be pretty confident that the end you were joining was going to stay open so you didn't get trapped in it. You also had to be pretty sure it was the right valley. And you also had to be fly up the side of it, not up the middle of it, because you had to give yourself enough room that you've got off to be able to turn around and come back out. The other sort of things you learned was that, and this was more applicable to single engine aircraft than twins, but it is because you didn't fly when you're going to cross a, a ridge line, didn't fly perpendicular into the ridge, you flew along the ridge. So that if you had to, you could always turn out again. And another thing you learned and is to be able to assess whether you're going to clear something in front of you. So if you had, if you hold your hands up, you can do this. If you've got a hill here and another hill behind you, and you wonder, am I going to clear this hill? If you watch the one behind, now if that's coming up like that, okay, you're I'm not going to clear it. Right? If it's coming down, you're clear. Okay. Now, the other thing with cloud was the same thing with cloud. The other thing with cloud is if you're coming up towards a gap and you saw a cloud in front of the gap, there was no point in saying, oh, I won't go there because the, gap, the gap's closed. Because quite often the cloud would be sitting off the gap. So you had to get up to it before you could make the assessment. Another deceiving thing up there was um, where the country wasn't necessarily mountainous, but where you had countries, uh, aerodromes based in a sort of a saucer with slightly rising countries. That can be very tricky because it doesn't look bad. But if you take off into slightly rising country and you have an engine failure, it just may be that the country's going to climb faster than you can. And there were aerodromes like that. So you had to be aware of the uh, terrain around you. I'll have a look at a couple of the airstrips. Now, the, the airstrips were by and large work around that. This is WOW. This is, uh, WOW aerodrome is uh, about 2,500 feet long. And it, it rises nearly 195 feet along its length, so about 8% slope. Now, that looks and sounds pretty daunting, but in fact, it wasn't hard at all because the slope was so great that even if you landed a bit long, you would stop pretty quickly because the minute the aeroplane was on the ground, it was climbing up a very steep hill. And we were, we got so comfortable with it that most times we just three pointed it. As soon as you got on the ground, you put the power on, climb up to the top there, right up the park there, and turn sideways and park. Uh, at one stage, there was uh, a Bristol freighter came out on a demonstration and they parked pointing down the hill. Mistake. Because the brakes failed and the, the Bristol freighter ended up down here somewhere. And the locals were moving in before the dust settled. But, uh, but we, we didn't find uh, that very hard. Down 
here where you can't see underneath the, where that photograph was taken was the river and in the river there was the wreckage of an old gold bridge, huge machine. And we used to reckon if we went over that at 3,800 feet, you were right, you're on a glide slope. But I, I don't think anyone found it very difficult. I don't remember TAA uh, or uh, ever having any sort of an incident there. There was a, an Air Force DC-3 written off there in the 1960s. But apart from that, I don't know of any DC-3 accidents there at all. Now, this is one of the really poor quality photographs. This is an aerodrome called Wabag. It's 6,000 feet high. And it's another go-round, no go-round aerodrome. And this was particularly tricky because you, not, it was no go around because not only was the hills in front of you, but you've got not had enough performance. Remember, at 6,000 feet, your performance was limited. And to be trying to do a steep turn and come back at this way would be just about impossible. It was quite a long strip, and uh, once it didn't present any problems. And uh, <clears throat> we didn't want Hong Kong to be the only place in the world with a curved approach. That was rebel, so we would do a curved approach in there to miss the volcano. And often these volcanoes were spouting, as we know, one not that long ago, it spouted voluntarily. Uh, rebel, very pretty city, and uh, as you can see, but now it's uh, virtually non existent, isn't it? This is Lay Airport. The, every morning there was a DC 6 came in, there was alternating days, Hansett and TAA, and the terminal was very busy. And uh, it's just a quick shot of that. And next one. Now this one, I just put this in for fun, really. This was looking on approach to Lay Airport. You can see here there's a bow of a ship sticking up. That was an old Japanese ship called the Tanya Maru. And it was quite a good landmark because if your weather was bad and rainy and you're coming down the coast, sort of marginal visual, you come down, you look for the Tanya Maru. And that would put, you know, if you're coming in this way, start a turn, you'd be right. And Coming the other way, you could see it in time to do the same thing. What were the differences for the aeroplanes that went to New Guinea, the DC-3? Well, one of the things were the side saddle seats. Now, we had a couple of aircraft that were set up as passenger aeroplanes, with normal 21 seat, comfortable seats. These were like this because they were able to be converted from freighter to passenger very quickly, because most of our operation was freight. Um, we often used to have a lot of passengers, up 30 plus passengers in them, especially doing charters for indentured labour. Now, the indentured labour system was that the plantations, say, over in Rebel or somewhere, they would um, hire a group of natives on a contract for a couple of years. And uh, we'd often have to fly them from the highlands right across to Rebel, which is a couple of hours. And uh, they, they were pretty jolly about it. They saw it all as a big adventure for us going off. And uh, what we would do, we didn't have any flight attendants. So the first officer got the job of doing what had to be done. Normally what we'd do, we'd get all the natives on board and we'd have enough box lunches for each one of them to have a box lunch. And they, they thought the box lunch was pretty nice because it would have a piece of chicken and a, and a, a thing of fruit juice and a chocolate or something in it. So they were pretty happy, but... Um, that was about the limit of the, uh, of the uh, cabin service for them. But we used to feel a bit sorry for them because even though they were from the highlands, they probably weren't used to how cold it was going to be if they went too high. And the DC-3 heating system was hideous, if you could work it. <laughs> and uh, that was very difficult. Um, okay, thanks. Now, Peter, I think, threatened this with us. going to talk a lot about props, but I won't talk too much about them. Except that you, you can see here that there are two different styles of props. There's, these, this is what we call a needle blade. This is a paddle blade. And as you know, the function of a propeller, the propeller is just a, like the wing of an aeroplane. Instead of creating lift, it takes the power from the engine and turns it into thrust. Now, like the wing of an aeroplane, if you want a wing to a high speed wing, you have a thin, sharp wing. If you want a low speed wing, it's going to be fatter and, and, uh, uh, and uh, it'll fly slower, but it'll provide more lift. And so the same with the prop, the, the, the broad props here, they um, provide 
better climb performance. The airplane doesn't fly as fast, but they were certainly better. And there was another advantage, and that is that obviously the function of the propeller is to take the power from the engine and turn it into thrust. Now, if, if you keep reducing the power, eventually you get to a point where the engine can't drive the propeller. And then the airflow starts to drive the propeller like a windmill. And so you have the, the propeller driving the engine, and that's not good. Engines aren't designed for that. And uh, it's, it's normally a thing to be avoided. However, if you could imagine a circle and see how much of that circle is taken up by the area of the propeller. You can see that on the paddle blade, it's going to take up a lot more area. So whilst it's functioning as a, as a windmill, it's actually creating a lot more drag because it's filling up more of the space. Now, whilst it was undesirable to let the propeller windmill, if you were going into one of those one-way no-go-around strips and you already had to gear down, you already had full flaps, and you still felt you were a bit high, if you put the propeller up to, we normally had about 2,000 revs on the propeller. You put the pitch up and got the propeller up to about 2,300 revs. That would increase the amount of area that the prop was taking up and it would create drag. So it was like putting down a bit more flat. And so it wasn't a good thing to do because it's not good for the engine, but Considering that you might have to do it once in the blue moon, and considering that the engines were the bulletproof Pratt and Whitney engines, that they were beautifully maintained and that they were treated very gently for the rest of their lives, to have to do that once in a while was worth it for the, uh, the benefit. And I think in the time I was there, I only ever saw it done once. But it was quite effective. Another lousy slide, but about the only one I can find. As you know, aeroplane performance is dependent on the air density. And uh, air density being to do mainly component of, or the components of air density are altitude and temperature. And of course, New Guinea with high altitudes and high temperatures, you have very high density altitudes. But the aeroplane's performance was very, very effect badly affected. And for a long time, the Civil Aviation Department he said, well, unlike elsewhere where you must always account for density altitude, we'll let you get away with a fair bit of that up there so that we can keep the show on the road. But eventually the pilots union said, okay, well, that's all right, except that every takeoff we do is dangerous. So we would like some uh, accountability. So they produced some charts which reduced the weights that we could use in the highlands. And of course, that got the angst of the Highland Charterers because they were used to the old way. So TAA thought it would come up with a solution. And uh, that was that they worked with theory aviation here in Australia. And they put a couple of JDO bottles on the bottom of the airplane. And these bottles were fired by two switches which were just in front of the throttle. So you could just fire them like that. And the idea was that if you lost an engine, you could fire the JDO and it would give you about 30 seconds of power, which they said was equivalent to about half an engine. So it would give you about three or 400 feet of height. And uh, anyway, once again, I don't know that it was ever used in anger, but they had a shelf life. So everyone got to fire one once in a while, um, but uh, I, I didn't. But the story I'd like to tell you about this photograph was that TAA thought this was pretty darn clever. So they invited everybody down to give them a demo. They got all the administration people who paid for charters and all of the charters and the other airlines. We were all down on the tarmac at Lay, including a group of first officers like myself who were down there to watch. And our flight superintendent announced that the aircraft that was taxiing was not a rig flight for this demo. It was a genuine Karoka charter, fully loaded, being flown by two check captains. And he said that what they would do, they would take off. And with the JDO, they reduced 
the V1, which is your takeoff precision speed from 81 knots back to 74. So he said at 74 knots, we had a simulated engine failure, fire the data, you know, see how it all works. And that's what happened. Took off, engine crackled at about 74 knots, data came on, why it went. Absolutely beautiful. It went up, got about 300 feet, and the uh, and then the data went out. And then it started to sink. And sink, and sink, and sink, and sink. And eventually, it started to make a right hand turn and head up the Markham Valley. And by that stage, the flight superintendent could stand it no longer. And he said, Well, one of your first officers, get on the radio and tell them to pull those bloody wheels up. <laughs> <laughs> because the DC3 will not climb with the wheels there. I, I sort of digressed a little bit. I was going to talk about uh, the, you know, just generally flying around New Guinea. And for those of you who have done it, will know what I mean. It's just a beautiful place to fly around, scenically beautiful. The, uh, the, uh, the, uh, everywhere you went, there were signs of civilization. There were villages everywhere. And uh, there were so many different tribes in New Guinea. And often a tribe might have been more than just a family. But they had really good little buildings and they'd be fenced off from garden patch. And, and you'd see them everywhere. The, some of the coastal scenery was particularly spectacular and, and also a lot of the trips had little, like all airline pilots with a fine little perks on each trip. And uh, one of the perks was uh, we had a trip that went from Rebel right down the east coast of Bougainville to a place called Buin. And uh, Buin was, uh, have you ever heard of Book of Baskets? Do you know what they are? Yeah, well, they're called Booker baskets. There's a particular New Guinea type basket. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but they're a beautiful basket. They're very, very strong. Um, um, and uh, they're, yeah, they're, well, they last forever. And uh, anyway, they were made, even though they're called Booker baskets, they're actually made in Buin only. And uh, so every time we went to Buin at the Catholic mission here, we'd land and be straight off there and we'd all go and buy book of baskets. Every one of them had a baby basket. That was a great big book of basket that you carry the baby around in. And uh, so that was a lurk. And one of the other lurks was something that resulted in me making, doing the only mutiny I ever did as a, as a co pilot. And uh, that was that on the way down the Bougainville coast, the first stop was Booker. And we'd go down and back to Booker. And uh, if on the way down, if you said to the natives of Booker, set it up, what they would do, they'd get a big piece of bamboo, about this round, so long, split it down the sides and push it together so it was that shape. And they'd fill it up with mud crabs. Um, well, they'd, they'd split it, so they'd made a, made a thing that they could fill it up with mud crabs. And uh, so the captain, whose name was Keith, um, he ordered his mud crabs. And on the way back, at Booker, we picked them up, and from there, we just had a one hour flight back to Rebel. So we're sitting up there and cruising across the water, and I can hear all this scratching and clanking. And what the hell is that? Look around, here's this flaming crab, crab coming up the aisle. He's about that wide, he had claws on him as big as my hand. And I said, Keith, one of your crabs has got out. And he said, I'll oh, go and grab it and put it back. And I said, Be bugger, it's your crab. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, anyway, Keith and I, Keith is in his 90s now living in Brisbane and we still meet and we still have a laugh about that. But this was my only mutiny. This was rope starting an engine where what they've done, they've round the rope around the spinner there. The engine's all be primed up and everything. And then they'll pull it with the tractor and hopefully that turning it over will start the engine and the rope will come free. I have heard of it being done by hand with a group of, getting a group of native support. I never saw it done, and uh, I think it was you found this photo, wasn't it, Peter? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> as an occupant, uh, sort of filling in time to amuse myself while I was in uh, New Guinea, I went out and walked around, looked for a few wrecks. That was a DC, uh, sorry, a V17 that had been crashed on the side of a hill near Wow. It had been totally stripped out. There was nothing in it, but it was a great walk up to it. The, uh, that fellow there, so it was a police officer at Wow. He was a good friend of mine. He arranged a uh, a bit of a party of natives to help us, and we uh, spent a day walking up there and back. 
I'd also walked out to a Vaulty Vengeance in the middle of the Markham Valley uh, with a friend of mine, and he he was an ex-army bloke and he loved guns. And he took two guns out of the Vaulty Vengeance wing. And uh, they are now in the Oakley Museum, I believe. But uh, there were wrecked aeroplanes everywhere. You know, and the funny thing is that we didn't care. Uh, and now, when I think, having had some uh, exposure to the Warbird movement myself now, I, I just can't believe that we never see it. They're, they're just off the end of the runway at uh, Port Moresby going south in Bootless Bay, there were two B-17s just under the water. Uh, there were, we knew where there was lightning, there were gap aircraft all over the place. And we just didn't care. Uh, not far out of Lay was Nadzab. And uh, I'd been out to Nadzab a few times, and that was a big base, a lot of Americans there. And what we found there mostly were whiskey stills set up. And uh, also, um, you pick up the aluminium uh, mounting trays or mounting things for, for, for the bullets to go in the gun. They still all work perfectly. Uh, this, uh, this, once again, another bad slide, but just to show you how many DC3s, that was DC3s parked along the strip at Garoka all up there for the, uh, the Garoka show. And we were just flicked through, there's a few different aeroplanes here. See, I had, when they took over the service, they, they had the, the Otter on Slopes. That was based in Port Moresby and mainly served in Papua. There's a hybrid DC-3 TA Qantas color scheme. Now, this is interesting. I, uh, I was coming back into Lay one day and I heard them calling a call sign Foxtrot India Alpha. And a very good friend of mine used to fly Foxtrot India Alpha in Australia. And I said, oh, I'm a mate up there. I was going to have a beer with him. And when I got there, I couldn't find any of his airplane. And I, and I said to the tower, where's Foxtrot India Alpha? And they said, well, that's that white lake person. And that was belonging to the French Navy. And I think that aircraft now, I'm, I'm almost sure this is the aircraft that's about to fly in. Well, this one here, this, this went, this one went back to, um, it got as far as Perth and sat there for a long time. Then it went on to England. Yeah, but this, is, this is another one, but they yeah. both went to Perth. Yeah, you're right. There was another one that's in the museum at Ball Creek. But this one went, well, I've seen it this one. So it was one of the white necklaces anyhow. It went to Beacon Hill in England. They sat at Beacon Hill. When, by the time they got it there, they were so broke they couldn't do anything else with it. So they just left it. They sat there for years until eventually the RAF uh, got a hold of it and they made it a gate guardian at Scampton, which is the, uh, the base from where the dam bus was set off. Anyway, they it sat there for a long time and there were two old brothers called Peyton and they, they had another brother who had been killed during the war in Bomber Command. And so they decided they would like to have the airplane on their farm as a monument for their brother. So they, they bought it. Now, this is sort of making up the story, but as it goes along, I mean, the important bits are true. And what, what happened? They got it. They got it there and they had it there, and people used to come and look at it. And one day, someone said, I wonder if we could start an engine. And they did. They, they got an engine going. I thought, well, that's pretty good. Let's see if we can start another one. And they ended up, they got them all going. So then someone said, well, we got them going. Why can't we taxi it? So they started taxing it. And then this started to attract a lot of attention. It became the centerpiece of the museum. And, uh, and so they now got it all painted up in proper RF colours. And they, people can go and go for a ride, go for a taxi of it. I've got a picture of a friend of mine sitting up in the left-hand seat, taxing it. Just no. Just no. And uh, anyway, they've now decided that there's, uh, I think at the moment, there's uh, two air weather locations in the world. There's one in Canada and there's the British uh, Royal Air Force Historic Flight. And now they're talking about getting this one going and getting to fly. Um, at the same time in Port Moresby, I remember one day there was that and there was the next slide, which was a B-17. And that was also French. That was a, um, a uh, survey flight aircraft. And another day, there was the Lancaster and the B-17 and the US Air Force B-50, because they were based there doing MET flights. And up at Bayer River, 
on the, that, that's an aerodrome on the Waigi Valley. <coughs> that was um, one of the big sheep of old Yonkers. BA introduced the Bristol freighter very successfully. Uh, I didn't fly it, I did the engineering course on it, and they decided they didn't need any more first officers. But um, it's, uh, it was very successful. And in Port Moresby, we had the Catalina. Uh, that's the survivor, one but one uh, chunk of Taru. Uh, the, 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 this one is the survivor. And they used to just fly around the south coast of uh, uh, Papua and some of the river places. Now, and there, now a bit of story here, as I said to you before, I think one of the things that would be really worthwhile doing sometime is researching more about the Baleen Valley in West New Guinea. And at that time, West New Guinea was Dutch. And uh, it's about 1962, myself and a, a captain called Charlie White <coughs> were called in and told we were to take a DC-3 to um, Hollandia, which was the capital, uh, and put ourselves at the disposal of the, this, this company that had the one DC-3. Because the, the um, the United Nations had created a temporary administration in West Virginia, and the Dutch were determined that they weren't losing anything. They were pretty, pretty cranky about the whole damn thing. In fact, whilst we never saw any part of it, there was a pretty hot war going on that far away. The, uh, the uh, um, Dutch hunters, Hawker hunters, and the Indonesian uh, uh, MiGs were in a serious air fight. So we never, we never saw that. And so when we got up there, we found out that what we were going to do was that they, they had a whole heap of building material. And they said, we're not leaving that for them. They want it flown up into the Baleen Valley and, uh, and just dumped there. And they had some soldiers that were going to load it for us and unload it. And we just had to go up to this valley. Well, this Baleen Valley was just like our Wagi Valley, it was huge. Beautiful valley, but very, very, very steep mountains to get into it, about 9,000 feet to get in, and down into the valley. And we landed at uh, the little airstrip, which was just a, a dirt strip, one hut. That was called Womina, but they now pronounce it Womina. You might have seen it on the radio, the television recently, because it's now a big city, and it's the center of a lot of unrest with the natives who want uh, the they want to be their own country and they're trying to get freedom from Indonesia. Uh, that experience up there was great. And, and I found out since so much about the Baleen Valley and uh, that is really worth looking at. Now that was Charlie. Charlie's the one on the right. And uh, <laughs> he was a great bloke, Charlie. One, one of the really nice things about uh, about our time or my time as a co-pilot in CAA was that there was quite an age difference. The average first officer was you know, probably below 25. And most of the captains were all men, they were 35 to 40. <clears throat> and, uh, and, but there was a very definite master and apprentice relationship in the cockpit. Different I suspect today. But, and, uh, and we expected every captain to criticize us and we accepted it happily. It was a learning experience. And, uh, and they accepted the responsibility of doing it. He was one of the best. And that's the young fellow I knew. That was uh, these natives there. The, the interesting thing that you would find out if you follow up the story is that the natives there were particularly advanced in their civilization. They were, they were very, very well organized farmers. Um, they had really good irrigation systems. They were probably more advanced than the fellows on our side. The big event in New Guinea, of course, was the day you left going, when you were going to go finish. Because you were leaving something you'd done for three years, which was terrific experience. You were leaving a whole group of friends you had shared that adventure with. And, uh, you know, even the friends, your houseboys, they'd, they'd be sorry to see you go because they'd know they were never going to see you again. They'd come down to the airport and see you off. And anyway, one chap decided that he would uh, uh, celebrate his going finish in fact. That's how he did it. Anyway, that same man, he was a very, he was a talented pilot and very competent. And uh, 
whilst the company couldn't uh, actually approve of that, I think they eventually let it go because he ended up the head of standards of the chief tech and training company, CAA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. hmm? yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I've sort of run out of things now. Any questions? Mm -hmm. <laughs> It, it, it did, and uh, it, it did. I, I don't know much detail. I know who did it, and I know that it was very, very uh, taken very seriously by TAA. What happened was it was, it was a pretty silly act. Um, the the airplane was full of school kids, and he took off and uh, did a load of low beat up, and there were a whole bunch of hysterical mothers at the terminal watching it happening, and uh, he was uh, he was disciplined for that. And I, they were the only two beat ups that I know of. Beat ups were not a common thing in TAA. Yeah, that was uh, the elector used to go up to uh, Port Moresby or up uh, Sydney, Brisbane, Port Moresby over the hip to Lay and then come back the same way on a daily basis. And uh, that was it. He's, he took off. People tend to notice when an elector comes and does a beat up in the middle of Lay, is right on the edge of town. The town's almost right around both sides of the aerodrome there, too. There's a place that's getting a lot of publicity these days, of course, is Manus Island with the refugee camp there. And we, one of our flights, uh, one of the nice flights we used to do, we'd go from Lai to Madang, Weewak, Manus Island, Cavey and Gravel, <clears throat> and back the next day. And uh, Manus, was, there wasn't much activity at Manus, but one, that was another place where people who were, were collected seashells used to make an arrangement with the natives there. And on the way back the next day, they'd get a collection of the most beautiful seashells. I didn't get any posting to Papua New Guinea. We'd like to have had one. But uh, before I joined TAA, my very first paid job was to go and get a Cessna 172 from Port Moresby and fly it all the way back down to Camden. That'd be good. My 200th hour came up in that trip in about 25 hours. Well, I consider yeah. myself very lucky because after the three years of being based in New Guinea, I've actually maintained a over the years, right up until about 10, nine years ago, flying in and out of New Guinea for, for different reasons. The last job I had was um, flying gold out of uh, the western, the southern highlands of New Guinea in a PC-12, which was nice. I had a marvellous two weeks in Papua New Guinea between finishing flying with Doves and Alice Springs and going on to Fokker Friendships. And I got a fistful of uh, crew supernumerary vouchers. And I was able to go everywhere I wanted to anyway as a passenger all over Papua New Guinea and uh, in lots of places. And uh, as has been mentioned, Madang was one of the major bases there. And there was a first officer who was just finishing his going finish and it was his last trip. <clears throat> and he flew the aircraft up to uh, Girima, uh, one of the places up in the Highland anyway. And uh, then he was having a rest on the way home. Anyway, the captain invited me to come sit in the co-pilot seat from shortly after takeoff. And I flew that DC-3 all the way back to and landed at Madang. He took me right through the landing and oh, didn't good. take over until we were on the runway, rolling down the runway. Oh. <laughs> he had been one of my predecessors on the doves at Alice Springs, so he mm -hmm. knew what my system of flight, what my likelihood of, oh. my manner of flying would be. <laughs> of course, I didn't tell a company that. Are there any questions here? Yes. I don't, I, don't have any, I don't have any questions, but I, I will verify what Ray said about the Balam Valley. Having been there quite a few times, it is it's very rich. The, the soil is, you can dig down feet, still the same sort of soil as you got on top. It'll grow anything. Plenty of, <coughs> man, plenty of water, and it's a big population that live in it. But it's, it's a very interesting place. And the, and the valleys that run off it, further, going further west, are also very interesting. So anyone, uh, as Ray said, take a bit of an interest if you want to look it up. It's, it's, it's really quite interesting. And how do you and spell he, the name uh, of that? One of the most amazing stories that comes out of it was that there was a, a wealthy yank called Archbold. And he was wealthy enough when the Catalina first came out to be able to buy a Catalina. And he was interested in uh, botany and things like that. And he decided to do a, a trip to New Guinea, and he went to the Bali Valley. And uh, that's just the, uh, the start of a lot of interesting stories. But what was amazing was that they set up a base 
on Lake Habinia, I think it was called, this lake was nearly 13,000 feet high and they were taking on and off in the Catalina with two Pratt and Whitney 1830 engines, the same as the DC-3. And that, that's an amazing. And uh, they, they had a, a, a base down on the flat country near Hollandia. Hollandia, which was the old capital of West New Guinea, uh, was um, MacArthur's base during the war. There was a big lake there called Lake Santani, and he had a, a base there looking over the lake. And when you go there now, there's a huge concrete uh, thing, a shield with MacArthur's shield on it. Um, uh, but the, the, the Archibald expedition, they had, they were living in that area for something like six or eight months, up to a hundred people. And, uh, and ferrying people and supplies in and out off this huge, uh, very, very high lake. Archibald's Catalina, I think was a straight flying boat too, wasn't it? Was not not an amphibian, is that right? Um, I don't know. I know it was serviced in Bankstown or Sydney, but not. Must have been an amphibian. Well, maybe then. it might have been served with banks now, they might have done it on the water. I don't know. Mm. It ended up um, uh, the uh, Archibald had as one of his ambitions, he wanted to do a westbound circumnavigation of the world. And about that stage, um, um, Australian aviator, famous. Um, Hang on, names is gone. No, no. P.G. Taylor. Um, thank you, Taylor. Well done, Taylor. He uh, uh, he wanted to believe that with the oncoming, with the war onset of war, that there'd be a loss of connection between Australia and England, and he wanted to pioneer a route across the Indian Ocean. And so he tried to convince the Australian government to do it, and eventually uh, they agreed, and they. They said, the problem is, what sort of aeroplane can you do with him? And Taylor said, the ideal aeroplane is the Catalina. And this fellow in New Guinea has got one. So he approached Archibald and said, on behalf of the Australian government, can we buy the aeroplane? And Archibald said, well, you can, but I want to continue going west to America at first. And so they, that, the arrangement they came to, and, and Taylor actually took complete command of the aeroplane. And he, he flew it across the north of the Indian Ocean, um, <clears throat> landed at Cocos. He, he started off going to Cocos and had to divert to Batavia due weather. Came back, got to Cocos, and he ended up in Mombasa. And, uh, and then the aeroplane went on, but it must have come back. That should be turned off. I don't know why it's doing that. Um, anyway, um, but that's a, it's an interesting story, the whole thing. Anybody out in Zoom land, do you have any questions? No. No comments? Well, we might yeah, this is, this is uh, Ted Goda here. I'd just like oh. to say hi to Ray. Good day, Ted. And uh, you're looking well, old mate. Thank you. And uh, your, your talk brought back a lot of good memories, uh, both of... Uh, flying in DC-3 in New Guinea as, as a country and also, of course, flying the DC-3. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was good to see you and good to hear. Thank you. Well, I can put out to these folks, you're an old one talk. I am an old one talk. I, I originally went to New Guinea after I left the Navy and flew light aircraft. And then, of course, I went back in 67 to fly the Twin Otter. Yeah. But, um, I, I had to fly the DC-3 while I was up there with TAA to do my route endorsements, in spite of the fact that my logbook already showed I had a, a complete overall type rating for all of the airstrips for the whole of TPNG. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, had to learn to do it TAA's way. Yeah. Yep. Oh, well, that wasn't yeah. such a bad way. Sorry? I said that wasn't such a bad way. No, 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 it was good. Good fun. I enjoyed every minute of it. Yeah, good on your head. Still living in, in New Zealand? Uh, well, I, I spent half the year in uh, in Noosa and half the year back in NZ. I just got back a, just a week ago, as a matter of fact. Okay, good to talk to yeah. you. You, you too. We'll catch up with you again sometime. Hope so, Ted. Cheers, mate. Cheers. Anybody else from Zoom land? Did you come east?
if you, if you, sorry, if you go east from the Balam Valley back towards the, oh, the Australian border or you know, New Guinea border, there's a snow-capped mountain there. It's a permanent ice cap all the year round. During the day, it's like a kid's ice cream. It starts to melt and just drips off the side. Come nighttime, it all freezes again. So it's a permanent ice cap at 16,000 plus feet. That's quite interesting though, because if you look down the jump from that height, this is jungle down on the lower lands, and uh, here's this ice cap. It's quite quite interesting. You've got about what, five degrees south. And uh, remember uh, something I intended to mention in this when we looked at that map of uh, the TA route to New Guinea, that the second slide, second or third slide there. Um, the we TA operated as a domestic airline within the confines of New Guinea, except for two flights. The one was to Hollandia. We used to operate, even though this is apart from the time I went there for the uh, during the uh, uh, temporary administration. We used to do occasional flights to Hollandia, and we do occasional flights down to Honiara, which was part of the British Solomons. But because they were both considered to be international flights, we had to do those with a quarter slot number. And, uh, but the, the Hollandia flights used to be popular with our wives because the Dutch had very, very good supermarkets there. And they, were, they always had big, nice big boxes of Bowles chocolates. So it was a requirement you came home with a box of Bowles chocolates. Um, and Hollandia was a, 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 a Honiara, was interesting. You, who lived in Honiara? Yeah. That was a pretty interesting place too. And uh, it was very terribly British, terribly, terribly British. And, uh, and uh, the, before we took off, the police would come out and they were, they'd have their khaki Bombay bloomers, safari jacket, Sam belt, Sam, Blem, Sam Brown belt, piss helmet, and the open top um, land, land, crew, land Rover, not Land Rover, uh, yeah, land, uh, land Rover. And what they would do if there were any pigs on the strip, they'd drive up and down the strip first with a shotgun and scare the pigs off so we wouldn't run on, run on take off. <laughs> but they were very, 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 very proper. And uh, one day I was there that the pub, uh, you, you just run down to about where these front windows are and you're at the water and you could sit there having a beer and you could see the shark fin just off the shore. And one day I was sitting there and there was a, a big rumble coming up some sort of rumble coming from behind me and a big white sundle and just came over the top and splashed down in front of us. <laughs> uh, Royal New Zealand Air Force. Well, the tales could go on for a long no, time. But we'll wind up there and thanks very much, Ray. Okay. And we very much appreciate your coming. Pleasure.